Looking ahead, what's in the forecast for 2017? In 2017, we would expect an extreme year in the stock market, but to the upside. And really what underpins that is the following. From an economic standpoint, we think that people don't fully appreciate how strong the global economy is. From a political standpoint, we think this will be the year of uncertainty too, but more tied to what's going on in Europe than the US. That should help stocks. And from a sentiment standpoint, we think this is a year where the animal spirits return back to the market where people want to be in the market because they're afraid of missing strong returns. Also at a high level, as we think about 2017, this should be a year where the global leadership happens from foreign stocks over U.S. stocks. Also this year, and this is maybe one of our more controversial calls, is that we would think in 2017, Long U.S. rates fall, whereas most people think that rates will rise. You know, digging into some of the specifics there, you know, I think one of the bigger surprises on the horizon for investors this year is a big rebound in corporate earnings. We've been through a pretty long period here where just in aggregate earnings have been very weak. Now, that's been heavily skewed by what's happened with energy company earnings. Energy prices have fallen so much, that's weighed so much on energy company earnings that headline earnings, whether you're looking at U.S. stocks or global stocks, we've been through a pretty long stretch where there's actually been decently negative earnings growth. But that's all about to change, and we think it's going to catch a lot of investors by surprise. You take away just the negative year-over-year -year effects on energy earnings, and you take those from a big negative to a positive, and suddenly headline earnings start to look a lot better. So we're going to transition from an environment where you've seen negative earnings growth. It's actually been positive for most sectors, just very negative tied to that weak resource pricing. That's just been one more reason for investors to say, well, why don't I just stay on the sidelines and see what's happening with corporate earnings and so forth. They're going to get hit in a big way with some big positive earnings growth. It's very likely to be well into the double digits this year. So you take a negative earnings environment, turn it into a very strong positive earnings environment. You add a little bit more belief in those earnings, a little bit more enthusiasm. That all bodes well for global equities. And the economy continues to grow, the global economy, not gangbuster growth, but growth nonetheless. And that's against a backdrop where inflation's, while it's risen a little bit here more recently, it's still relatively tame. So the global economy continues to, to be just fine. Earnings are set to grow. If you look at valuations today, they're pretty darn reasonable. And against a backdrop where I think we'd all agree we're pretty far from euphoric levels of sentiment, uh, and I think that sets the stage for a pretty strong year for stocks in 2017. And I think that's particularly true here in 2017. If you just look at the history of markets and the political influence on markets, you know, we talk a lot about politics and what politics mean for stocks and so forth. I think last year's a great illustration of what, how important that can actually be. And if you look at the history of markets and you look at inaugural years, they tend to be a fairly variable year from a stock market standpoint. You kind of take each year of a president's term and break down how stocks have done in each of those years. You get the most variability in inaugural years. They're either up a lot, they tend to be, when they're positive, they're really positive. Pretty much all positive years except one historically have been double digit positive in inaugural years, but you have more down years as well. So this is a year where we think the highest probability is certainly that you get a nice big up year for equities. And we're always being vigilant about what's the downside risk out there, but I think this is a year where that antenna has to be up almost even a little bit more because you do tend to get more variability. There are more policy risks and so forth in an inaugural year. So we're very mindful of those things, but today we see a lot more positive out there than we do negative. And when you look at consensus expectations, I mean, they're even more muted this year relative to last year. I mean, one of the exercises we go through at the beginning of each year, or at the, the, the end of each year, really, is to go out and poll all the chief strategists, and we ask them what are their return expectations for the market in the following year. And what we'd seen in 2016 were people were expecting returns of about 6.5%. And what we know is the market rarely delivers those returns right in the meat of that bell curve, so to speak, of those forecasts, and it delivered a return to the upside. This year in 2017, those chief strategists have even become more muted in their return expectations. The bell curve has shifted to the left, so to speak, average returns of about 
And again, our sense is markets surprised to the upside, surprised even the most optimistic forecasts. But tied to some previous comments, what's more is there's very few forecasters that are expecting a big down a lot year. And so there too, for that reason, we need to be mindful and vigilant of that. Yeah, but really the defining feature this year is that, trans that transition from a joyless market to a joyful one, where you start to see animal spirits picking up. And by animal spirits, it's uh, a desire to take action, where people have been content to just wait on the sidelines. They've been fearful about a lot of things to this point. And you're starting to see that investor enthousi enthusiasm start to pick up now. And what I think is important about that is that that's coming off a very low level. People have been very dour and negative for a long time. They're just starting to get positive. And so you're probably going to hear a bit more and more about our expectations too high, are people getting too optimistic. We're a long way from folks being too optimistic. We're a long way from that euphoric type top of a market. We're just starting now to see more optimism. We think that's got a long way to go before people get to be too optimistic or euphoric. And as the year progresses, as you get rid of some of that uncertainty, we think that optimism continues to grow. As people refocus on some of those more positive fundamentals, that's really a key driver for the market this year, that transition from joylessness to joyfulness. Whenever stocks go through a flattish period, like the one that we just got out of, investors tend to look for alternative investments. And one of the things that comes up regularly is, why shouldn't I just invest passively? What would you say to that? Well, I don't think there's anything inherently wrong with a passive investment strategy. But in practice, the fact of the matter is nobody can really buy a passive index fund, set it, and forget it. And they, they mean to. They mean to, and that's their intent. But in practice, that rarely happens. So tactically, it's easy to do. Psychologically, it's probably one of the hardest things to do in investing because really, in, in, in just as a reminder, really what passive funds are designed to do is to track the overall market, less some fees. And generally what you tend to see is when markets are strong and they're in this passive fund, they find some other better performing category, especially when you're in a flattish market period as well, and they're in this passive fund and it's not really doing much for them, but they see some other category of the market doing well, then that gives them the urge to sell that passive fund and chase heat and go buy something else, only to see that have work against them. And then what do they do? Conversely, if you get into a period of downside volatility, maybe the depths of a bear market where the media is railing against owning equities and stocks where people just they don't want to have anything to do with the stock market, they do exactly the wrong thing at the wrong time, sell out of that passive fund and want to go to cash. Those are active decisions. That's no longer a passive strategy. But to s take that a slightly different direction, in parallel to what Bill said, there's endless stories that show that the holders of no-load funds get hugely lower returns regardless of category than the no-load funds themselves because they in and out them at all the wrong times for the same reasons that Bill was describing. So let me take you through sort of recent history. The trend toward passive is heavily driven by the easiest passive thing to do being to buy the S&P 500, which has been a period where the S&P 500 has been strong. You can see why that becomes alluring to people. The fact of the matter is, in that joyful last third, as Bill points out, people will seek more and better, so they'll seek specialty passive funds, but that's not a passive decision, that's an active decision. There is nothing wrong with passive. Passive is like a screwdriver and a hammer and a saw and over here a pair of pliers. But to use the pair of pliers to try to put in a screw is a big mistake. Were you surprised by the outcome of the election? There's a yes and a no part to that. So I want to go back and remind our viewers, our clients, that which we were saying basically from early in the year last year. Early in the year last year, we were showing clients in our review material and in seminars that the nature of the country had shifted over 30 years to a point where if we should have what we call a bottom-up election versus a top-down election, and the states should vote 
as their state legislatures are perfectly, exactly, then as I said in my Forbes column in July, as I said in my Financial Times column in July, Mr. Trump would end up with, just by that, 314 electoral college votes and win the presidency hugely while potentially losing the popular vote hugely because, as I said there, you, he's going to get much more hurt in California, the biggest state, than he might win by in Texas, the biggest Republican state. He'd get hurt much more in Illinois than he might win by in Republican Georgia, comparable size state. And if you take New York and Florida, you throw those in, he could easily do, and my Financial Times column just had these exact numbers, lose the popular vote by several percent and he'd still win the presidency. What we didn't have a clue about then is what would the popular vote be? So if you look at my Forbes column going into the election, it said very clearly that we didn't have any strong view one way or the other about who would win. And to the outcome of the market, we didn't really think it mattered. Because to the outcome of the market, it was about the falling uncertainty and that whether you got Ms. Clinton winning or Mr. Trump winning, either way, the market should rally because that uncertainty falls apart and now the only uncertainty you have is the development of the administration. What do you think the outcome on the stock market will be of different Trump policies? One of the things that most people don't appreciate, and this is not really a statement about President Trump, this is more a statement about the President of the United States, is that the President actually has a much less power than people think. And if you're a great President and you've got complete control of the House and complete control of the Senate, maybe, maybe you get two things passed. You certainly don't get everything passed that you campaigned on. So when we think about um, Donald Trump's, excuse me, when we think about President Trump's policies, we really don't think he's going to be able to do as much as he says he's going to do. So if you were fearful of all the policies that he's talked about, or you're optimistic about all the policies. Either way, I think you have to get used to the fact that most of those policies are probably not going to be put into law. And they're just talk and they're just conversation. And the fact of the matter is, is we and most people, pretty much everybody, doesn't know exactly what uh, President Trump's policies are going to be. You know, there's been a lot said on the campaign trail since he's officially become president about what he may or may not do. But we still don't have a lot of certainty about what's at the top of his policy agenda, what could he actually get done, and what can he get done, and so forth. Right now, there's a ton of speculation, and that really drives that falling uncertainty. One way or another, we're going to start to see what's real and what isn't real, and that should allow for more clarity and people just feeling more comfortable. Not everybody's going to like all the outcomes, but just like they might not have liked the out le outcome of the election, maybe they did like it, but just getting that certainty, knowing exactly what has some potential to happen, what doesn't, getting that clarity is the most important thing this year. Speaking of confidence in the uh, new administration and how people view that, uh, as Aaron points out, our interpretation is that the more conservative investor, a politically conservative, uh, tends to kind of look at Mr. Trump as a Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde phenomena. They kind of think he's likely Dr. Jekyll, but they fear he might transition into Mr. Hyde. On the other hand, the li more liberal investor is quite sure that he's going to get their Hyde. And the fundamental feature that I think most people in America don't think through when it comes to markets is that the U.S. is very important as investors, but we have investors all over the world. The global market is a market of global investors. And the non-U.S. investor is much more perplexed at this moment in time about who Mr. Trump is or isn't than the American investor is, regardless of what you as an American investor think he is or isn't. Because they don't understand our system as well. They don't understand things like, how can it be that he loses the popular vote but wins the election? How can this happen? How can, because they don't understand our system, they don't get the how-cans. And from that, they've got tremendous, there's much more 
sense of uncertainty about Mr. Trump by foreign investors actually than there is about American investors, regardless of what any American investor does or doesn't think about Mr. Trump. And in that, that provides more potential falling uncertainty because foreign investors do believe in their bones that America is very, very important to the world, the biggest economy, the driving economy. And when they have more uncertainty about Mr. Trump, they feel more uncertainty in general, and all that should help fall as the year progresses. Thank you for viewing the Capital Markets Update. For views on current events in the world of investing, visit marketminder.com. Updated daily, it offers on-demand access to Fisher Investments' most current thoughts on capital markets and the global economy, as well as our sometimes irreverent commentary. We hope you will enjoy it.